Okay, this is um, what we decided needed to be part two of the last uh, video of um, living the catastrophe. Um, and uh, this one is called Expecting the Unexpected. And actually, I could say that even doing this video was an unexpected thing that happened, which is I did it before and there was no sound. So I'm doing this one for the second time, which for me is very difficult to repeat myself. Um, it kind of drives me crazy, but let's hope I can do it. Okay, so um, the reason I decided to do this is after I was done with everything last time, Gabby says, well, what about 9-11? Isn't that a catastrophe? And I went, oh yeah. And I went, well, I know why I didn't do it. It's because we didn't expect it, okay? The expecting the unexpected has to do with like the approaching doomsday that you're thinking about like um, 2012 or, or the turn of the millennium or um, the Fatima predictions or, um, you know, all sorts of things that, you know, I addressed last time. So this time it's, uh, what I'm going to focus on is false flags, which of course is the, um, it's one way you can talk about 9-11. As a matter of fact, it's the major false flag of this millennium so far. Okay, so first I did a little um, research on false flags and they actually began to be used, that phrase began to be used in the 16th century more figuratively than literally. Um, referring to, let's see how they put it here, referring to a deliberate misrepresentation of somebody's affiliation or motives, something used deliberately to misinterpret or misrepresent in this way. So it's fakery, basically, pretending not to be. And um, <clears throat> they were using it especially to talk about the papacy, which is kind of interesting. And then in the 19th century, there was finally a false flag that actually was literal, which is pirates approaching ships without their pirate flag but with a flag that looked like an ally of the ship they were approaching and then of course jumping on their ship and doing a number on those people so that's where they called it a false flag it's not the real flag it's a pretend flag and then uh let's look at let's look at oh, just the uh, false flags in the 20th century uh for example um start with the wars all wars start with false flags um, you know, it's hard for us to believe because most people are not warlike, aren't? they're not really oriented towards going to war, so they have to do something to get the people on board before they start a war. So with World War I, uh, let's see if I can remember it, uh, World War I, yes, it was the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand by Serbians who apparently had the motive but not the means. And so the question's always been, who gave them the means? Were they patsies for someone else? That kind of reminds me of Antifa and the BLM riots now. And then World War II, Hitler, this was an, this is an interesting one. Hitler wanted to invade Poland and decided to use soldiers with Polish uniforms, but with German uniforms underneath them and carried out a false flag attack in Germany blaming Poland, okay? It shows the levels of deception that are possible uh, with, with uh, false flags. Okay, then there's the, the Vietnam War, and I think just about everybody at this point knows that that famous Tong Kin incident where an American destroyer was supposedly attacked four times by, or twice, by three Vietnamese torpedo boats in 1964 was completely made up. It absolutely did not happen. I can remember sitting there nursing my newborn baby um, when that, that announcement came on the radio and I was just appalled because I knew that was the beginning of a war because that's how we do it. Okay, the Vietnam War. Oh, no, that was, that was the Vietnam War. The first Gulf War. There were several uh, false flags used for that, but one of them was a media hoax where the daughter of the Kuwaiti U.S. ambassador played a nurse on TV testifying to witnessing Iraqi soldiers throwing babies out of incubators in Kuwait. Okay, designed to get the public furious. 
and to want to save the babies and uh, save the people that uh, are being ruined by these the enemy. Uh, so we always have to create an enemy in order to do a false flag, in order to do a war. Okay, and then there's the second Gulf War. Now, who does not know by this time that no WMDs were ever found there, despite a lot of searching? Uh, none were found, and yet we did a war that I don't know how, how long it lasted or how many thousands it killed, but there we are, and it actually started the endless war on terror. It was actually billed as that. It's endless. There's no natural end to it. Then just look at the political shootings uh, in the 60s. For example, Kennedy shot by at least two people because there were bullet holes that, re that you know, came from behind and the side. The Robert Kennedy Association uh, shot by uh, someone else other than Sirhan Sirhan because he wasn't close enough to have done it because there were powder marks on apparently Kennedy's neck. John Hintley, Hinckley shot Reagan. Lots of school shootings. As a matter of fact, since the year 2000, there have been 13 school shootings. And then, of course, there's theater shootings and the Las Vegas shootings. And interestingly enough, most of these are done by, quote, lone male shooters, usually long, young, usually white. And um, if you want to jump down a real rabbit hole, um, Google MK Ultra and um, false flag shootings and you'll find all sorts of stuff. Um, it may be that each one of these, these young men were uh, Manchurian candidates. They were programmed by MK, MK Ultra trauma-based conditioning to be triggered at a certain time to uh, kill whoever they were supposed to kill. And I tend to think that each time a false flag shooting occurs like that, that somebody is being mind controlled to do it. It's not their idea. Then the big one, 9-11. The biggest one since the Kennedy, since the first Kennedy was associated, excuse me, assassinated. And uh, I don't know about you, but I woke up that morning and somebody Somebody called me on the phone and said, look at the television. So I did and to see, for the first of many times, see the building fall, the building fall, the building fall, the building fall. And of course, the planes running into it, weirdly, it's like, it's almost like CGI. It was like, how could planes have melted like that in, into the side of a giant building? It was just so weird. That was so weird. And then the passport port found on the ground, completely unblemished by one of the so-called uh, men who had hijacked the plane. And then uh, the fact that the buildings fell right into their own footprints. Huh? How could that have happened when something happened the very, at the very top of the building? And then, of course, the big one, which is Building 7, that afternoon, nobody, some, a lot of people don't even know about Building 7, which, again, fell into its own footprint. And they have definitely decided that that was a, a typical demolition, that particular building. But the others likely were too. In fact, there was somebody here, apparently, who came to talk about Building 7. He talked for three hours, giving all the details about how that happened. He wasn't even talking about who, who was responsible or why it happened, just how it happened. And he kept the audience on the edge of their seats for three hours with all the details proving that it was a controlled demolition. And then, of course, there's Pennsylvania, that hole in the ground, but there weren't any body parts. There weren't any plane parts. There was nothing but a hole in the ground. Huh? Huh? Then, of course, the Pentagon, the hole in the Pentagon. Huh? That was supposedly made by an airplane, a big airplane? No, it wasn't. It couldn't have been. There was no place for the wings to have gone through. Huh? And I think this is very typical of false flags where they are designed to confuse us, to just put one over, us, over on us that is so obvious that if we're thinking, we realize it's not true, but then what is true? So then we're left with this constant, you know, it's like a distraction to not let us see what else is going on, but also to keep us distracted. So we'll just keep fighting among each other about what really happened. But in any case, it's some kind of a dastardly deed that was done by somebody 
pretending to be somebody else likely or to pretending for another reason likely and designed to provoke fear, terror, um, uh, demoralization, uh, a sense of hopelessness, and it, and it works. Um, so now let's come to the one that's happening now, still happening. This one's even bigger than 911 because it's not a single event. Yes, 911 killed 3,000 people and then, of course, was used as the pretext to start not one but two wars against Afghanistan and then against Iraq. It was also used to bring in the so-called Patriot Act, which was lying on a shelf ready to be pulled off and put to use, uh, certainly with our all. Immediately, there was a new department created called Homeland Security. And, you know, the airports changed overnight, requiring all sorts of weird things from passengers, which really um, are, are, are silly. And, uh, and that continues. I'm one of the people that won't go through those. What is it? Rape scan? R-A-P-E-S-C-A-N? That's what those machines are called. Rape scan. I don't go through them. I, w I prefer to be groped, thank you. Okay, so back to COVID. So COVID started, and that was in mid-March, with two weeks. It's supposed to be only two weeks. Don't worry, it's just two weeks. And what has it been now? Almost six months? And it goes on and on and on, and there seems to be more and more fear generated constantly by the MSM, the mainstream media, which, of course, was always you know, in concert with the false flags. Um, it's like the MSM is the propaganda arm of what we now call the deep state. If you put that in Saturn-Pluto terms, which I've been talking about Saturn-Pluto and also blogging about Saturn-Pluto, you might say that Pluto is deep and state is Saturn. Saturn is structure or form. And Pluto is the depths, the penetrating depths. So the deep state, a Saturn-Pluto configuration in the first place, um, you know, we can look at that as what's behind all sorts of things. And this COVID just keeps going on. It has ruined people's lives. It has, you know, demoralized them completely. People don't trust each other. People don't trust their own bodies. That's what gets me the most. This has exposed a fear of one's own body. Think about that. Very rarely do you hear talk about actually working with your own immune system. In other words, getting fully embodied and then working to help your body uh, fend off whatever's out there because all sorts of things are always out there and all sorts of all things are always in here too, viruses and bacteria and so forth, in latent form, which then get triggered often because of stress, especially the stress provoked by fear. So fear itself, you could say, is a virus or it has created this virus as a, um, you know, a mass contagion, uh, which everybody is still terrified of. Um, one thing I have noticed is over time now, uh, more and more people, as soon as there's a false flag, as soon as there's a mass a shooting, for example, which hasn't happened, by the way, have you noticed? ever since COVID started. They don't need them anymore, they've got COVID. But every time that happens, the, um, the, the anons on the internet start going, okay, who really did it? Everybody knows that whatever the mainstream media is saying is false. Whatever the official line is, that is, that is what is not true. Everybody knows that now. It used to be a couple of days would go by before they started to get wind of, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense, but now it's like, Immediately, it doesn't make sense. We know it's not doesn't make sense. And now we find that whenever there's a big anticipated event coming up that might be good news, the Anons look for what is the distraction going to be, what's the false flag going to be, so that we won't, won't pay attention to it. So we're now anticipating false flags before they even happen. So the public is becoming more and more aware of these catastrophes and how they are engineered by the deep state to make us all sit in frozen fear. Okay. Um, so it appears that nothing really is as it seems. There's always layers to events, especially those that are brought into the public eye. 
also there's mind control not just through uh, the MSM but through movies entertainment music in general pharmaceuticals how many people are on antidepressants and depressants these days what about the college kids who take Adderall to which is kind of a form of meth or near it to help them study to help them focus on their study so they'll be competitive with their peers who are also taking Adderall you can't be competitive without it apparently but once again we always have a choice and the choice is always between fear and love fear gets transformed into hatred but actually it's fear underneath the hatred but love just is those are really the only true emotions fear contracts love expands one gets projected or denied the other fills and fuels generously so i just want to end with um a note on COVID again this 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 is a the herald times the local paper and i just want to mention the the stories that this is true every single day the stories are always about COVID on the front page i think every single uh, every single article is always about COVID. Here's one huge financial fallout from the fact that football isn't going to exist. Apparently 40% of the uh, university's revenues come from sports. So it's a big deal. The council okays $2 million recover forward passage package. That's a phrase they're using to help Bloomington get back on its feet. And the big one to me is this one called IU trustees back sanctions for COVID directive non-compliance. And that is saying that even tenured professors can be fired if they're not in compliance with COVID okay. regulations. Now, uh, university, which one is good note, math. one very <laughs> interesting note is uh, I've been writing letters to the editor and they never get in because, you know, I, yes, I, I tend to be somewhat snarky sometimes. And, um, and I, so I just keep writing them because maybe at least they're, maybe they're having an effect anyway, uh, the people there, whether they dare to publish them or not, because the, the, uh, newspaper is just as officially fear-based as anything else around here in this academic town, this leftist leaning academic town. It's so fascinating how both coasts and the academic towns of this, um, nation are, or the academic cities are leftists and everybody else is not. And I mean, in other words, fear filled and everybody else is not. Okay, so uh, I wrote this letter that didn't get published and I sent it to another person here in town who I really appreciate because his letters get published and he's really good. Every time uh, HT asks a, and Herald Times asks a um, question that a lot of people can answer, so you have 30, pa 30 answers on the page, I always look for his answer because it's usually the only one that really makes sense to me. So I sent my article to him on Facebook. I didn't hear back. I thought, oh, okay. So here I am alone again. <laughs> and then. About two weeks ago, I get this uh, message from him. Oh my God, I just now found your letter. Thank you, this is exactly how I feel. And so then I thought, oh wow, because I had just written another letter which hadn't gotten in. And I sent that to him. He said, oh wow, yes, this is the same. I feel the same. He said, let's get together. So we did. We had a great time for about an hour. And we talked about how we're losing friends and gaining friends at the same time during this situation. The more we come clear with who we really are, uh, the more the people that um, are still afraid can't be around us anymore. And the more we find people who, who we didn't ever know before who can be around us now. So it was the day after I saw him that I looked at the paper and my goodness, my letter was published. I couldn't believe it. And not only that, there was a letter from him too that was published. So I just want to read these two letters and then we'll call it quits. Okay. My letter is called, they called it, they, they always titled them, appreciates coverage and asks for more, which is true. I wish to express my immense appreciation for Laura Lane's detailed and balanced ongoing coverage of the recent Vox Booker imbroglio 
Hers is an unusual example of truly investigative journalism in this highly politicized era of agenda-driven news, in quotes. Now, to break it for a minute, I used to be married to a newspaper end editor, so I'm highly aware of what's really investigative and what is not. And that was a very good article, a very good series of articles. Another topic worthy of deep investigation is COVID-19 in Bloomington. What is really going on? How many posted deaths are actually from COVID or just with COVID due to comorbidities or age, etc.? Plus, what kinds of tests are being run here and how reliable are the results? For example, if the antibody test, a positive does not indicate COVID, but simply the presence of exosomes, secretions from cells infected with any number of viruses, including the common cold, in the past. Detailed investigation has become especially important due to new sure to affect our community further soon. Metrics which declare Bloomington number one college town for vulnerability to COVID. Metrics like, um, I saw this article, um, it's like, um, you know, how many students versus the population, how many restaurants, how many bars, and so forth. It's time for us all to stop believing outside authorities. This is the most important thing. And pay attention to our own bodies. Rather than fearing them, let us celebrate the brilliance of the immune system, which when fully supported and engaged is our first and best line of defense. And remember, fear itself is an immune suppressant. Can't emphasize that enough. Okay, here's my friend's article. It's a great title they gave it to. Are you in a bubble? America is deeply polarized. I believe that polarization is primarily the result of the media and social bubbles most people exist within. It's as if their brain cells have become extensions of those bubbles. They, they're told who's good, who's bad, who to fear, when to be outraged, when to go to war, and by omission, what to ignore. How do you know if you're in a bubble? There are thousands of pictures of Donald Trump and Nancy Pelosi. An editor is free to pick between images that portray either as kind, wise, neutral, befuddled, or angry. If your newsfeed consistently shows negative pictures of either politician, you're in a media bubble. There are 30, 330 million people in America doing innumerable things. Sometimes cops with three children die breaking up family disputes. Sometimes people in MAGA hats beat up peaceful demonstrators. If your news feed tells you only one kind of story, you're in a bubble. If you have a circle of friends and one makes just one true fact-based comment that doesn't unequivocally support your group's worldview, do you ostracize him or her? Then you're not just in a bubble, you're fighting to stay in your bubble. The world is not simple. And that's a really um, great way to end this. Um, he is very good at staying neutral while he's talking about this, even though he tends to be in the same bubble I'm in. We're very aware that we're in a bubble. We're both trying to expand our bubble so that we have a larger and larger picture of what's going on and not just get caught inside some kind of a little, I call it a cement, you know, it's like a, it's a, a um, helmet, you know, everybody's in their own mental helmet, and I'd rather have mine get larger and larger. Of course, you're always going to have uh, access to only certain sources, there's only a certain uh, number of minutes in a day, and furthermore, not everybody is really all that interested in this, but even if you're not interested in all these things, the catastrophe of fear, the catastrophe they are constantly pushing during this period, is there in the air to think that you can avoid it, you're kidding yourself. All you can do is become highly conscious of it and learn to transform it into love or shed it or you know, sit in meditation till you find yourself again. Do something to let go of the fear. Thanks.